Welcome to the NCDWI Guy podcast, where defenders of the Constitution assemble to prepare for courtroom battle, and firm owners gather to develop marketing strategies that will revolutionize the practice of criminal defense. Here's your host, the NCDWI Guy, Jake Minnick. Hello, fellow freedom fighters, and welcome to episode 81 of the NCDWI Guy podcast. On today's episode, we are talking about PBTs, portable breath tests. That's right. The main evidence in a lot of DWI investigations against your client and evidence that shouldn't be used at all in making an arrest decision. This is one of the greatest places where there is a disconnect between the law and what happens in actual practice. It is one of the major places of disconnect in a uh, DWI case where practice and legal analysis diverge. So we'll talk about that. Before we dive into the content for today's episode, two quick announcements. First of all, as I mentioned on last week's podcast, we are looking for uh, an attorney in our Jacksonville, North Carolina office, associate attorney in our Jacksonville, North Carolina office. If you are interested in applying for that position, uh, we have a job posting on our company webpage on LinkedIn. You can get more information there. You can go to our career page on our website Um, You can send an email to uh, my uh, legal assistant, Stephanie, uh, email Stephanie at Minick, M-I-N-I-C-K law.com with a resume. Um, And we can send you further instructions that route in terms of applying for this specific position. So um, uh, please, please, if you're interested in applying, please apply. We are looking for somebody in Jacksonville. Secondly, Uh, Next week's episode is going to be uh, a great episode. We have federal uh, district court judge Robert Conrad in Charlotte, uh, Honorable Robert Conrad, who is going to be on the podcast to discuss his new book about uh, Saints Thomas More and John Fisher, Uh, an incredible read, Uh, really really cannot recommend it enough. Uh, He just published this book earlier this year. Uh, It is, uh, again, about the lives of of, uh, Thomas Moore and John Fisher. Um, We are going to talk about their lives, but more importantly, about some of the things as lawyers that we can learn from these two great men uh, that will help improve us as human beings, but also as advocates in the courtroom. So very much looking forward to having um, a, a federal, uh, federal judge, but also a person that I greatly admire as a human being on the podcast. I had the blessing of being able to intern while I was at Charlotte law with judge Conrad and, uh, just really enjoyed my time working, um, under, under him and his clerks and uh, getting to learn in that environment, but uh, really exciting to have him on the podcast to talk about this this great work that he has just published. So without further ado, we will dive into portable breath testing. And this is something, again, that is frequently used in DWI investigations. Some officers use it the way it's supposed to be used, but I would say probably many more officers do not. So how is this supposed to be used? And then we will dive into some specific statutes and law that applies in this situation. How is this device supposed to be used? It is supposed to be used. The PBT, the portable breath test, the roadside screening device is supposed to be used to confirm whether or not the impairing substance that the officer suspects is causing a person to be impaired is alcohol. That's it. That's the whole purpose of the portable breath test. It is not to get an actual numerical reading and use that numerical reading. It is not to determine whether or not by means of the PBT that a person is impaired. It is simply to help confirm that a suspect that an officer believes is impaired 
is impaired by the specific impairing substance of alcohol. That's the whole purpose of the PBT under our framework. And so when you look at when that device is supposed to be used by the officer, when is it supposed to be used? This is a rhetorical question because nobody can answer this. So I'll answer the question. It's supposed to be used at the end of the investigation, not at the beginning. When you have an officer that walks up to your client's vehicle with a portable breath test, a buzzer goes off. Eh, wrong. That's wrong. You can't do that. Okay. That's not how the portable breath test is supposed to be used. If you have an officer that walks up to your client's car, says, can you sit tight for just a minute? I'll be right back. Walks to his car, gets a PBT, comes back up and says, would you mind blowing into this for me? Eh, wrong. That's not how the portable breath test is supposed to be used. That is using the portable breath test to determine impairment, to determine whether the officer believes your client is impaired. It's not being used to confirm that alcohol is present or that alcohol is indeed the impairing su substance that the officer is seeing as uh, he's evaluating your client for impairment through psychophysical testing. So the, the way that an officer that is NHTSA trained, an officer that is trained through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in DWI detection and standardized field sobriety testing, the way they're trained to do that is at the very end of phase three. That's when you do PBT. So you look for signs and indicators of impairment in driving, phase one, vehicle in motion. You look for uh, impairment in the person's uh, physical indicators. So their, their speech, odor of alcohol, how they're moving, walking, talking. That's phase two, personal contact. And then phase three is the standardized field sobriety tests. And in session seven of the NHTSA student manual, you will see that after all three standardized field sobriety tests are done, that's when the portable breath test is supposed to be administered to determine a suspect's impairment level. After all three field sobriety tests have been done, that's how they're trained to do it. That's how NHTSA says to do it. Many times in a DWI investigation, you'll see officer get client out of the car. They'll do a portable breath test. They'll do some field sobriety tests, and then they'll do a second portable breath test. And as we'll talk about here in a few minutes, there's a five minute waiting period. Most of the time between the two portable breath tests that have to get done roadside in order to be an admissible PBT, to be something that positive or negative they can present to the court. So if they are trying to kind of save time at the roadside. Maybe they're trying to get portable breath test in first. They know they have to wait five minutes. So now I'm going to do my investigation during that five minute period. And then afterwards, the issue with doing it that way is twofold. This is, this is just kind of the general backdrop against which you're going to see portable breath testing. The issue with getting suspect out of car and immediately doing PBT or doing PBT while they're still sitting in the vehicle and then doing it five minutes later again after field sobriety test is twofold. First of all, that's not how they're trained to do it. NHTSA says do PBT after you've done everything else. At the end of phase three, after phase one, after phase two, after the standardized field sobriety tests of phase three, at the very end of phase three, do the portable breath test to confirm what you're seeing. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is that most portable breath tests that are used in the field, and this isn't true of all of them, but most portable breath tests used in the field give the officer a numerical concentration. They don't just say positive for alcohol. They don't just say positive or negative for alcohol. If it's positive, they give a number. And so what happens then? Well, if the officer sees a 0.18 and 
and then does the three standardized field sobriety tests after that, how could that number not influence what they are seeing on those tests? You know, positively or negatively, maybe they see a 0.04 on the PBT and then they do field sobriety tests. I am guessing that's not the case. This is, this is my, my hunch. If you blow less than a 0.04 at the roadside before being asked to do field sobriety tests, you're probably not going to get asked to do field sobriety tests. Okay. Side, sidetrack there, but it's impossible to put that number to the side. What you would otherwise see on those field sobriety tests really cannot help but be shaped by the bias that is going to be created in that number. So there's that twofold problem. First of all, it's going against training. And secondly, the result of that PBT done before field sobriety testing is creating bias. So point both of those things out to a judge in a motion to suppress either the portable breath test individually, or if you're making a motion on probable cause, lack of probable cause, go to that, go to that point when it comes to the portable breath test, if that's being used in the probable cause determination. So NHTSA says in session seven, it's supposed to be done at the very end. Go to session seven of NHTSA. Again, even though this isn't state specific, this can be very helpful, especially if you have an officer that has gone through the NHTSA training. There is a ton of great information in that uh, session. If you go to page um, 28 of session seven in uh, the most recent manual, which is still the 2018 manual, the 2018 student manual, at the top of that page, page 28, you will see in the PowerPoint slide that you should administer the PBT after underlined and italicized, so emphasis added by NHTSA, administer after SFSTs, administer after SFSTs, right? That is when an officer is told to do this. So NHTSA then goes on to talk about what are the advantages of portable breath testing? How can it be used to eliminate medical problems? How is it used to establish probable cause, which really isn't relevant because in North Carolina, that is very specifically laid out, which we will get into in just a moment. Talks about the limitations of the portable breath test in terms of the evidentiary value, as well as with its accuracy. It talks about residual mouth alcohol and how long that would be anticipated to remain and why it's important for there to be at least a 15 minute period of waiting, which is also required by North Carolina. But NHTSA again points that out. It talks about breath contaminants. NHTSA talks about uh, breath sample cooling and how that can impact the portable breath test uh, results. It talks about radio frequency interference or RFI and how that could impact the result of a portable breath testing device when done near radio equipment. So it goes through all of those things. And again, it indicates that after you have done everything else, phase one, phase two, the standardized field sobriety test of phase three, at the very end of phase three, after the field sobriety test is when you're supposed to do the portable breath test. So if that's not being done correctly in order, point that out, use the manual. If you have an officer that is trained, that is NHTSA trained, if you have multiple officers and one of them is NHTSA trained and the other is not, even if the other one is doing the portable breath test, ask the one that is NHTSA trained, when are you supposed to do the portable breath test after the field sobriety test? So uh, go through that. So that is kind of the general background fame framework for portable breath testing. So what about North Carolina specific, um, uh, law on portable breath testing? So there's a couple of places to look, uh, the North Carolina general statutes, the North Carolina administrative code, and then case law. And so we're going to touch on a couple of these things. The places that we are going to be looking at today is North Carolina general statute 20-16.3, 
the North Carolina Administrative Code, and that is Chapter 10A of the North Carolina Administrative Code, Section 41B.0502 and 0.0503. So uh, 10A NCAC 41B.0502 and 0.0503 of the North Carolina Administrative Code. And then finally, we're going to look at state versus overrocker from 2014. So going to our general statute first, 20-16.3 subsection A says a law enforcement officer may require the driver of a vehicle to submit to an alcohol screening test within a relevant time after the driving if the officer has, and then it gives some different options. If the officer has reasonable grounds to believe the driver has consumed alcohol and has committed a motor traffic violation or been involved in an accident or a collision. So if there's reasonable grounds to believe that the driver has consumed alcohol and has committed a moving traffic violation or an articulable and reasonable suspicion that the driver has committed an implied consent offense under 20-16.2 or was stopped at effectively a lawful checkpoint. So if there's reasonable grounds to believe an implied consent offense has been committed under 20-16.3A2, that is the most frequent time that you are going to see this portable breath test device getting used. That's the legal grounds by which an officer is allowed to ask your client to submit to a breath test. So part of the analysis is what has given the officer a articulable and reasonable suspicion to believe that the driver has committed an implied consent offense. What is the reasonable suspicion? Maybe that's based on the driving. Maybe that's based on an admission of drinking at the uh, window while the officer is interacting with your client. Maybe it's based on an odor of alcohol. Maybe it's because there's an open container in the car, a combination of these things. So that is still required. If you're going up to a checkpoint, there's not really any requirement that the officer have with that reasonable suspicion. Uh, or at least that there's, there's minimal uh, reasonable suspicion required because there's no driving that is generally problematic. So there may be less of an opportunity to articulate that reasonable suspicion, but that is an initial hurdle that the state still does have to get past, which is what is the reasonable articulable suspicion that the officer believes that your client has committed an implied consent offense. So that's question number one, where that, that's, that's part number one of the statute. The other helpful part of the statute, 20-16.3C, says that no screening test for alcohol concentration is valid under this section unless, okay, so you have to have this, this in place. First of all, the device is one that is approved by the Department of Health and Human Services. So it has to be an approved device. And there's a list of approved devices in the North Carolina Administrative Code. And then secondly, the screening test is conducted in accordance with the applicable regulations of the department as to the manner of its use. So this is what makes the North Carolina Administrative Code so important because under 20-16.3C, it says that this screening test is not valid unless it is used in accord with the applicable regulations of the Department of Health and Human Services, therefore the North Carolina Administrative Code. So when we get into the North Carolina Administrative Code, if the officer is not following those uh, code procedures, as required by statute, this is what allows you to pick the officer apart on that front and to ask the court to exclude the portable breath test because it was not conducted in accordance with the applicable regulations. Finally, 20-16.3D, this is 
huge. This is huge. This is what we'll spend a, a good amount of time talking about. It says, the fact that a driver showed a positive or negative result on an alcohol screening test, but not the actual alcohol concentration result where a driver's license refusal to submit may be used by a law enforcement officer is admissible in court or may be used by an, by an administrative agency in determining if there are reasonable grounds for believing that the driver has committed an implied consent offense under 20-16.2. So what does that language boil down to? What does 20-16.3D say? It says an officer can use the positive or negative, but not the actual alcohol concentration, both in what the state is allowed to introduce a court can only introduce positive or negative, but not the actual result, but also what is the officer allowed to use in their arrest decision? In the arrest decision, in the officer's mental framework, they are allowed to use a positive or negative result in forming their arrest opinion, but they cannot use the numerical concentration in informing a arrest decision. They cannot. And this is where the law and practice greatly diverge, right? Because how many times do you think that somebody blows a 0.15 on the roadside, but does well on field sobriety tests and everything else that they do at the roadside? How many times do you think an officer says, well, did good on field sobriety tests, blew a 0.15, but I mean, what, what can I say? Didn't see anything on HGN, only one clue on the walk and turn, zero on the one leg stand. I guess I'm just going to let him go. No, that is not going to happen. That person is getting arrested. And what are they getting arrested on? based on the numeric concentration. And many times it is the numeric concentration itself that the officer openly says is the basis for arrest. Might even have an officer that doesn't have any NHTSA training, that doesn't have any training in field sobriety testing and limited training in the detection of impaired drivers, of somebody that they suspect is driving while impaired, just say, well, I, I pulled out my screening device. Person blew a 0.14. I, I told them that they were over the legal limit and I placed them under arrest. Happens all the time. And practically at the roadside, you blow above a 0.08 on a PBT. Likelihood of going to jail is really high. This is where the law diverges because the law says you don't get to use that result, not only in the courtroom, but informing your arrest decision. Overrocker, State versus Overrocker 2014 case really pushes that fact. In rejecting the state's argument that the alcohol concentration should be able to be used for PC purposes, the court very clearly says that that is not allowed not allowed. You cannot, uh, it's it, it, the stated at uh, cited state versus Rogers, the overrocker, uh, court in, in disagreeing with the state's argument said in Rogers, the trial court admitted the numerical reading of an alcohol, alco screening, uh, test in accordance with 20 dash 16.3 to help establish whether the arresting officer had probable cause for the defendants driving impaired. However, the pertinent language of North Carolina General Statute 20-16.3 that allowed the arresting officer in Rogers to consider the numeric reading of the ALCA sensor test was supplanted in 2006 by the current version of the statute, which is still the version of the statute. The plain language of North Carolina General Statute, this is still from State versus Overrocker, the plain language of North Carolina General Statute 20-16.3D prohibits the actual alcohol concentration result of an alcohol screening test from being used by a law enforcement officer in determining if there are reasonable grounds for believing that the driver has committed an implied consent offense under 20-16.2, such as driving while impaired. The court says you not only don't get to use the number in the courtroom, 
the officer does not get to use that in forming his arrest decision. It's very simply laid out in Overocker. The court does a good job of explaining the difference with 20-16.3 before 2006 and after the law changes in 2006. Does a very good job explaining that. It says plain reading of the statute after 2006 is that the officer no longer gets to use the numerical result informing their arrest opinion. So again, somebody blows a 0.15 at the roadside, they're likely getting arrested. The question really now in practical terms and how this plays out in the courtroom is, do you have an officer that understands the statute from, from following 2006, or do you have somebody that is confused about that? If you have an officer that understands they're not allowed to use that in their arrest decision, they're going to say, I didn't use the PBT in making my arrest decision. It was a positive for alcohol. Uh, that just indicated to me a presence of alcohol. I didn't use the number in any way, shape, or form informing my arrest opinion. And really, there's no way to kind of hold their feet to the fire on that. If they say something different on video, like, well, you know, they, they, they go back and, and talk with one of their officer uh, friends and say, well, he just blew a 0.16. So definitely going to take him down, down to the station then you can use that. You can, you can say, well, you said you didn't use it in any way, shape or form, but video shows that you indicated to another officer that that was the basis for your arrest decision. So you can still attack it, attack not only the admissibility of the PBT, but attack probable cause based on that statement to the other officer. But if an officer is well-trained, they're going to say, I did the PBT only after I did all the other field sobriety tests. I, I used the positive as part of my arrest decision, or I didn't use the PBT in any way, shape, or form uh, to, to form my arrest decision. I only used it to confirm that the impairing substance was alcohol. They will likely say the right thing. And then there's no, not really a great way to kind of hold their feet to the fire on that front if they uh, push, put that out there in the right way. But if you have an officer uh, that in their notes on video in the courtroom says, I use the numeric result of the PBT informing my arrest decision. That is a problem. It's a problem for probable cause purposes. They're not allowed to use that number informing their arrest decision. So make sure that you hold their feet to the fire point to 20-16.3, point to state versus overrocker in explaining that. So now to jump over to the North Carolina Administrative Code, uh, we're going to go with 0 0.0503 first. So this is 10 NCAC 41B.0503. This, first of all, this, this section of the code, first of all, under subsection A, lays out the various portable breath testing, alcohol screening devices that are allowed in North Carolina. So there's a list of them. Uh, there's quite a few. There's 11 listed on the most current version of the statute. Um, so it's likely that the one that the officer is using is on that list, but double check on that front. The one that I see the most of recently is the Alka Sensor FST. That's the one that I see uh, most frequently used. Um, under subsection B, it says the agency or operator shall verify, verify instrument calibration of each alcohol screening test device at least once during each 30-day period of use. So every alcohol screening device has to be calibrated every 30 days. Every 30 days it has to be calibrated. There should be a log that shows that this is calibrated every 30 days. You have an officer that is um, experienced in this. They will say every two weeks when I come in and on my Tuesday shift, I do my um, calibration of my screening device. And they'll have a log of that. If you have an officer in a smaller agency, remote county, um, that doesn't use this thing all the time, it would not be shocking if that thing is not getting calibrated every 30 days. Under subsection C, 
It says alcohol breath simulators, which are what are used to actually test individual devices. It says alcohol breath simulators used exclusively to verify instrument calibration of alcohol screening test devices shall have the solution changed every 30 days or after 25 calibration tests, whichever occurs first. First. So whatever is being used to calibrate the actual PBT that is being used in the field. So the, the equipment, the uh, breath simulator that is being used to calibrate the portable breath test getting used in the field, that simulator has to have its solution changed every 30 days or after 25 calibration tests, whichever occurs first. So both of those are present under um, subsection E. It says uh, the requirements of paragraphs B, C, and D shall be recorded on an alcohol breath simulator log or an ethanol gas canister log designated by the forensic test for alcohol branch within the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and maintained by the user agency in accordance with the user agency's retention policy. So it says there shall be an alcohol breath simulator log, right? Shall be an alcohol breath simulator log. So that log should exist for that breath simulator. Um, going now to point zero five zero two. This explains how the alcohol screening test devices are to be used. How are the PBTs, the portable breath tests, to be used? Under subsection B1, it says the officer shall determine that the driver has removed all food, drink, tobacco products, chewing gum, and other substances and objects from his mouth. It says dental devices or oral jewelry need not be removed, but all food, drink, tobacco products, chewing gum, and other substances shall be removed for the purposes of a PBT screening. Something that you can see on video is, does the officer ever ask if the person has anything in their mouth? Does the person appear to be chewing gum? Does the person appear to be chewing uh, tobacco? Uh, do they uh, smoke at any point, either before the first or the second portable breath test? All of those things should be looked at, particularly on video when you have it, but uh, also in terms of any statements that the officer makes in the courtroom. If, if you have any of those things present, if the person does appear to be chewing gum, takes a drink, whatever it might be, uh, has tobacco in their mouth, then under North Carolina General Statute 20-16.3C, the PBT should be suppressed because the PBT is not being conducted in accordance with the applicable regulations of the Department of Health and Human Services, which requires that those things, those objects, those substances be removed. So 20-16.3 is your means of suppression in accord with the North Carolina Administrative Code. Under North Carolina Administrative Code 41B.0502, subsection B2, it says, unless the driver volunteers the information that he has consumed an alcohol beverage within the previous 15 minutes, the officer shall administer a screening test as soon as feasible. If a test made without observation, uh, without observing a waiting period results in an alcohol concentration reading of 0 0.08 or more, the officer shall wait five minutes and administer an additional test. So what does all that mean? Well, basically th there have been numerous times where an officer has done one PBT and that's it. One PBT and that's it. That is not sufficient in most cases. If the officer does not wait a full 15 minutes prior to doing a portable breath test, then they have to wait another 
15 or, or, or wait five minutes and then do a second PBT. So if you have an officer that comes up, does a portable breath test, maybe does some other field sobriety tests and that's it, that portable breath test should not be admitted because of the fact that there was not a second PBT. If the officer comes up, asks your client to exit, does a couple of field sobriety tests, but still within 15 minutes of the stop does a PBT and then never does a second one, maybe another officer arrives on scene, whatever it might be, that PBT is not admissible. It's not admissible in terms of uh, number, positive or negative. It shouldn't be admissible in terms of the second officer that arrives on scene saying, well, Officer Jones told me that he had received a positive on a PBT. Shouldn't come in under any of that. Whether or not you want to suppress the PBT is the final analysis. So again, um, if that second PBT isn't done, then you go to the judge and you say under 20-16.3 subsection C, the North Carolina administrative code, the department of health and human services outline was not followed. Therefore this should be kept out of evidence should be just kept out of evidence. So that would be, that would be not admissible under our final analysis. And this is really kind of a, a strategy question. Many times the end game is not necessarily to just suppress the PBT. And the reason why is that if it's clear on video that the officer has used the numeric concentration of the PBT from his uh, roadside test as the primary means of his arrest decision, you do want, not want to really suppress the results of the PBT. You want that brought into evidence. So I give a good example of this. Had a client recently where the PBT was done one time. The officer indicated to client uh, peers, peers like you, you, you know, you've blown over the legal limit, places client under arrest. Doesn't ever do a second PBT. No confirmation that my client had been drinking in that 15 minute period. So we could move to suppress the PBT itself because of the lack of following of the North Carolina administrative code. You didn't have a second PBT that was done within five minutes. Therefore, the first one shouldn't be admissible. But to me, the better strategy play is to not move to specifically suppress the portable breath test, but instead to argue to the court, it's clear based on the video, your honor, the portable breath test, the numeric result from the portable breath test was not only used as part of the officer's rest decision, which is problematic under 20-16.3 and state versus overrocker, but it was the sole ground of the arrest decision, making the arrest invalid. And not only was it the main reason for the arrest decision, but it wasn't even properly conducted. There was no second PBT that was done as is required by the North Carolina administrative code. And so the officer is using evidence that he should not use in forming his arrest decision that was improperly obtained in determining that my client was impaired. So Again, you, you may have this strategy play where you could, under a combination of the North Carolina Administrative Code and the North Carolina General Statute on point 20-16.3, you could move to suppress the portable breath test itself. But for strategy purposes, it may make more sense in the, in the courtroom if you're arguing a lack of probable cause to let that portable breath test into evidence, because if that's the main reason the officer arrested your client. And that's apparent on video. And oftentimes it's, it's extremely apparent on video based on things that the officer is saying to your client, based on things that the officer is saying to other officers that are on scene, that they're using that number in making their arrest decision. If that's how the arrest decision is made, then you probably don't want to suppress the actual portable breath test result itself, numerical positive or negative, anything like that, because what you're trying to draw out is that the officer is using that numeric decision as the 
main reason for their arrest. And that's not allowed by 20-16.3. And it's not allowed uh, under state versus Overocker, which is just basically reiterating 20-16.3. So portable breath tests, they're important. They come up all the time in, in many DWI investigations. Look at the NHTSA manual on portable breath tests in session seven. Look at 20-16.3 under the general statutes. Look at the North Carolina Administrative Code sections. Look at state versus overrocker and be prepared to go to war in the courtroom. Look forward to speaking with you next time. If you found the information in this podcast to be valuable, I simply ask that you pay it forward and share this podcast with another member of the legal community. Also, if you would leave us a rating or a review on whatever platform you are listening on, I would greatly appreciate it.